always, this video is brought to you by our brand new full channel partner, Keto Crisp. The wonderful folks over at tastecando.com have officially signed on to partner with me in both my weight loss journey, which I am back on now, as well as sponsoring the channel. They have signed me up for a brand new affiliate program. So if you click the link down below, as well as put in my uh, discount code, you'll receive 15% off your first order. And I do get a tiny commission if you do purchase. So it helps the channel and you get something tasty and healthy. These are great bars. They satisfy. They keep you full for a long time. They have a lot of great nutrients, a lot of great natural ingredients. And for those of us in the keto and low carb world, we've often been demonized as a not a friend to the animals, uh, but these are 100% plant-based. So you can feel good about that too if you are of the vegetarian or vegan keto lifestyle. You, these are also for you. So with that being said, I want to say a huge shout out to Keto Crisp for sponsoring the channel and helping me to stay on the air here. And thank you all. So if you'd like to order some, definitely check them out below. I appreciate it. Hi everyone, welcome to Keto and Crime. Today I have my good friend Jim Hall from Atheist Edge. I know you, everyone knows him. Uh, he is uh, going to have a long-awaited conversation today on two classic sci-fi horror movies. Uh, we were supposed to do this last year and then everything got snowed under. <laughs> so Was it that long that, ago? Maybe not, maybe more like four Several months. months, yeah. Several months, so... Mm -hmm. But uh, in theme with our 31 days of Halloween, we're looking at, uh, being that we're studying so many real life cases of cannibalism, we're actually gonna look at two sci-fi films that also incorporate the same themes. So we thought it would be appropriate to add it to our Halloween repertoire. So we're gonna be talking about the classic movies, uh, 1973's Soylent Green, starring Charlton Heston, and um, 1976's um, Logan's Run, starring uh, starring Farrah Fawcett. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and uh, so we thought that we would be appropriate to talk about those two movies. Uh oh. Oh God, I can't believe I, I don't know the star of Logan's Run. Right off the top I know. Of my head. God, I'm trying to think. He he was uh, the York. old man. Yes. He's Michael a, York. Was he in Tron also? And he was in another, he started in another yeah. big movie too. He was in a, several of the old 1970s. Uh, yes. Uh, but so it was him and then also Peter Ustinov was another yes. big player in that movie. The same He was as the old in, man. He was the Wasn't old man. He, he yeah. was the old man. So I think we should start with what to me is the most fanificial, you know, fantasy driven one of them and that's logan's run okay uh, it was the last one made in this repertoire but it was also in my opinion the movie that kind of sh shuffled in the age of sci-fi it was uh, it and planet of the apes and uh return to the planet of uh the sequel to planet of the apes beneath the planet of the apes all of that kind of mailed 2001 2001 a space odyssey that was right around that time right right that yep. and uh also um the omen kind of shuffled oh, in the age yeah. of scientific sci-fi horror and also con contrary to proper belief it was movies like this that allowed star wars to be made in 1977 78 so uh, so if uh if this movie had not been made, this one, 2001, Space Odyssey, and Planet of the Apes, um, that that's what made the sci-fi wasn't a genre until then in, no, in, in on the big on the big screen. No, and wasn't. Logan's Run made a, it saw the success of those other two, and it's it they took a big gamble um even making this movie because sci this uh, you, just like you said it it really ushered in sci-fi movies on cinema, um, mo modern sci-fi, and. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. What people don't realize is that sci-fi was more of a a television genre. You had uh, the Twilight Zone, you had Night Gallery, you had um, tales, you know, other sci-fi other sci-fi shows, Lost in Space. Uh, sci-fi was really a television world. No one had ever thought about, oh, let's put it on the big screen. You know, mm -hmm. probably uh, Planet of the Apes was probably one of the first 
true sci-fi movies, but this kind of ushered in that golden age of sci-fi from the late 70s to the early 90s that we all know and love, I think. We're going to start with Logan's run first. Um, so you were talking about, so these the 31 days of Halloween that you're doing, your series, mm -hmm. is that is, is the theme cannibalism? Because the other one we're going to do, Soylent Green, that is definitely cannibalism. This one is, is euthanasia. It's not cannibalism, but uh -huh. it's kind of in that same, oh. Well, yeah. if you remember when they find the underground ice cavern with the robot, he is fr freezing human bodies for later consumption. Why do you think we're here? Why? Why? We were sent here. And you know it. You say others have been sent here. Where are they? In hiding? Hiding? Yes. Hiding. You know about sanctuary. I know you do. Sanctuary. You have to help us. You don't have the choice. It's not your decision. So tell us. Very well. Follow me. How did they get there? Regular storage procedure. The same as the other food. The other food stopped coming, and they started. No shit. See, okay. <laughs> I t okay, full disclosure for everyone watching, I did honestly take two full pages of notes um, when I watched these, when I went back and watched these two movies, but that was around the holidays, I think. That was a long time. That was a, several months ago, so I totally forgot that the, that was a, that robot did, uh, did uh, Lost in Space and um, what's the one, Robbie the Robot and Danger Will Robinson and, and the one, Lost Forbidden Planet, Forbidden, Forbidden Planet, Planet, the one that came, Forbidden yeah, Planet. It, it looked like one of those type of robots. I totally yeah. forgot, so they, he, it was freezing them in the ice. Mm -hmm. to to break them down and use as food for the people in the dome yep no yep. shit i don't know if i caught that when i rewatched it that's crazy so yeah this is perfect this is perfect for your well both these movies have a similar theme they represent a dystopia where a very controlling government uh the first one logan's run even though it was made later in 1976 it's more of a i think man-made dystopia like a 1984 there's obviously been some disaster uh that caused the world most of the world's population to be housed under what looks like a very advanced dome construction which was actually filmed in dallas at their new shopping plaza it was new at the time that's right. Dallas Market Hall is yep. where most of the indoor shots. Right. Oh, I might as well take this opportunity to say uh, the outdoor shots, when they finally come out of the dome, when they realize they can breathe the air now, either, mm -hmm. you're right, Tracy, either they manufactured the dystopia to keep control of people and keep them in the domes, and there was never anything wrong with the outside world, or there was some sort of apocalyptic event that was so long ago that now the atmosphere is better. I don't think we're given which one it is, but when they do come outside at the very end, my parents were cast extras. They filmed, you know, that shot, the, the beautiful waterfall area. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the uh, Fort Worth water gardens. My parents yeah. were cast extras. They were, they were in those brightly colored tunics walking around and looking at the old people <laughs> like, Oh, I've never seen an old person before. Yeah. Well, so what it is, is kind of this controlled environment that is ruled over by some sort of artificial intel intelligence, some sort of AI. And they literally won't let people live past the age of 30. A at the age of 30, they are literally rounded up on their 30th birthday and brought into this ceremony called the carousel. The carousel. And they start flying around in the air. And supposedly, according to the AI, they are given a rebirth. They are returned to the atmosphere and are reincarnated where, you know, we all know that they're just being killed. But they so, don't think that. They don't think so, that. They so, actually think they're being renewed. 
Yeah, th that's a good, uh, good. at least throw in a little bit of religion in here, it, atheist edge. So yeah. I always try to throw in the religious angle. So they really think they're going on to somewhere better. The, mm -hmm. they're, con they're thought controlled into thinking that, but the, the authority, of course, knows that's not the case. And what's right. the thing with the little babies in the, uh, I remember seeing babies, the whole nursery of babies. They're like, yeah. uh, they're is it like the Matrix? They're, yeah, they're, they're like the Matrix. They're grown. They're, they're grown. There's no sexual re re reproduction. A, a sexual, sex is merely for pleasure. Right. Exactly, for pleasure. And it's a very hedonistic society. Um, they they and, eat good food. They don't realize that it's other humans, but they're eating good f food. They're uh, being, they can get a sexual partner at the you know press of a button. Uh, and they live a very hedonistic, carefree lifestyle for 30 years until they're killed as a form one of population of things, control. One of two things, like when he, it's like, uh, what's the swipe right app that everyone, Tinder? Oh, Tinder. It's, it's like Tinder, but it's on steroids. It's basically press a button. You put, you plug in what you want and boom, someone will like teleport into your room within mm -hmm. a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So we only see men doing that. So is there misogyny here, or do you think women have this app too, and they can just teleport a dude into their room too? Interesting question, because it was based on the novel uh, Logan's Run by William Nolan, and it's and the same with Soylent Green, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Women have lost rights in this dystopian territory. It's very much a patriarchy. So I'm with you. I don't think women have the same rights as men. I don't think women are allowed to to do the same as men. Now, what's really interesting, Logan, our star, played by Michael York, is what they call a, um, he's kind of a police officer. And he actually goes after people that have tried to run to get away from the carousel. People that are near 30, and they all have this, um, sh this light in the palm of their hand that glows different colors, and when they get it's close a crystal. to crystal, it's a crystal. When they get close to their thirtieth birthday, it starts. It turns red and starts flashing. Right. So when you're and in then those... on your thirtieth birthday, it turns black. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so people um, will run to get away from being killed. People most that realize, don't though. Most, most are don't. brainwashed. Yeah. Yep. And um, so he's... You, those those cops are called sand the sand men. Sand men. Sand yep. men. And so he has special privileges because he is one of these Sandmen. His name is Logan, Logan Seven, I believe, and he Logan is Five. How do Logan I remember five. that? But I couldn't remember <laughs> that the people were being used as food. But I remember Logan Five. <laughs> he has a partner, Francis Seven, which is where I got the seven. And everybody is basically named. I mean, it's basic human names, American names that we all know, but they're all like numbered. So. Um, so basically, uh, Logan is a Sandman that is chasing these, uh, people that run. And according to what he knows, they've lost over a thousand of them, which meant according to them, a thousand of them have gotten away. But what we find out later on is that most of that thousand are the ones frozen down in the thing that we never see. They caught, they catch them and they take them down there to freeze them and use them for food. Well, the carousel, after they get zapped with the lasers, um, incidentally, the filming for that, everything was practical effects back then. CGI didn't yep. exist. No. So fire, the fire department was con in Culver City was, con I remember this, they were constantly being called out because you had 17, 24 different people on individual wires and they would always get tangled up and they'd be stuck up there in the fire department. They'd have to come and get them. But those people that got zapped. Uh, and power kinetics I, 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 on their back. Oh, that's what made him explode. So they get zapped with the laser. It's like laser tag. Yeah. <laughs> Lethal laser <laughs> tag. That's crazy. But
can you after imagine? they get zapped, whatever's left of them, I'm sure goes back into mm -hmm. the mix too for food. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you have to think about it. The whole outside world is destroyed as far as we know. Where are these AI getting the food, the organic matter to feed these people? Because there's literally thousands of people under this dome. You don't see any evidence of agriculture. It's all very high tech. So you just assume, well, maybe they're petri dish and food. You know, they're growing food in a lab. But it just seems the, they're going back to the most organic source that they have. Yeah, which is some the greenhouses. But you need to, I'm trying to remember, because they. I remember they used a huge scale model of, to make the dome. And they used that dome city for like star trek the next generation mm -hmm. the lots yeah. of other movies and tv series use that because it was it took up two gigantic lots in in uh hollywood yeah. and i guess they left it alone because others movies were used it used it um so if i remember right it looks like they have they can see outside in some mm -hmm. parts of the city mm -hmm. so yeah it's like did no one think hey you know what let's just go out there and test the atmosphere you know did anyone think outside the box and think maybe, hey, let's go at least test the atmosphere out there. Uh, I'm sure. They were, must have been under some strict brainwash controls. I would say so. And they're probably, probably the people that actually thought that way were probably considered like, for lack of a better term, QAnon type people. The ones that thought, oh, we can go outside and we can live longer than age 30. And, you know, we can we can do all this stuff. So probably considered like kooks and conspiracy theorists. But if you think about it, the ones that did think that there was some place outside the dome called the sanctuary, those were a, a weird religious cult. They all had that Egyptian mark tattoo on them where they the believed. Ankh. Yeah. He was an onk. The, 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 an the Farrah Fawcett wore it around her neck or one of the characters did. Uh, the, main char the main female character uh, yeah. played by... Uh, Jenny a gutter Jessica Six. oh shit she was hot yeah sorry she, anyway. she was <laughs> oh yeah um uh yeah but, so they were like a cult that's right mm -hmm. they were crazy conspiracy nuts yeah. and um in the book it was age 21 instead of age 30 I did not know they had that. to make it yeah they had to make it age 30 for the movie because they couldn't find any 21 year old big time actors not that I didn't read the book. I just heard that somewhere or read it somewhere. Isn't it, isn't it unusual, like, in, in cinema, whenever there's, like, some big dystopian or some cult that's in control, how they start eliminating people once they get to an age where they might start thinking thinking critically. Like, Logan's Run was 21 and 30. Uh, children of the Corn, you know, they, they killed the children once they reach, uh, reached age 19, you know. In, in Logan's, that is... A good point but in logan's run were they being killed off because they were reaching an age where they become become more skeptical or were they being killed off it was population control maybe i thought population control and also probably when you would reach an age where you might think this is bullshit you know well i was exactly eight that. years old when i thought when i finally realized religion was bullshit so I <laughs> <laughs> my crystal would have gone off early maybe i don't know um yeah wow that's interesting. But, but Logan is a Sandman that starts like, he has a big, you know, philosophical conversion in his head when he's like in his apartment. Yep. In his, oh, and that's uh, Jessica, <laughs> Jessica and Holly, Holly 13, played by Farrah Fawcett, also a member of the cult. I think this, uh, I think that this was Farrah Fawcett's first movie. Uh -huh, it was, and, she was, she had some TV commercials, TV roles, but she had just married Lee Majors. No, she yeah. married him during the filming of this. She had already gotten filming. hired. So the, right. this is another thing that is kind of antiquated. Well, it, who knows? It still might be happening with uh, that Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein and all these, mm -hmm. other, you know, it might still be going on just as bad as it was back then. All the, you know, the harassment and, and, and sexual quid pro quo kind of stuff, you know, going on. But Farrah Fawcett, she got this role because somebody that works on the set told the director, hey, there's this girl that lives in my apartment complex. She's always out by the pool and she's a knockout. You need to interview. And that's how she, it's like, really? Yeah. And I, Michael, I, think, I don't know. Yeah, Michael York had met her uh, via Lee Majors somewhere and said that she was a vision of absolute uh, uh, like loveliness. A work of art. Yeah. And, yeah, basically a work of art. And so she got it by virtue of her looks. 
literally. And it also turns out she's a fabulous actress. But when does that often actually happen, you know? <laughs> exactly. And and I think, you know, they, they miss they 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 miscast. I was so I'm a vampire freak. Um, I, I can explain why it would take an hour, but um, interview with the vampire when they mm -hmm. were going to do the Anne Rice, turn the Anne Rice book into a movie. And then I, I was so excited. I didn't want to see any of the previews. And then I learned, really, you're going to get Brad Pitt and and uh, dumb Tom Scientologist Cruise. guy, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, to be Lestat. Tom, Lestat's supposed to be six foot tall, blonde, and 25 years old. Tom Cruise is the exact opposite of Lestat. He's and I was thinking, you are going to blow my everything, <laughs> uh, every Anne Rice book in my, you know, I've ever read. You're going to ruin it. And well, the, you know, hat, hats off to him, even though he's a cult nut, he, he's a good actor and he pulled it off. It was a good movie. He did. He did. I, I love Tom Cruise, uh, right down to him jumping on the couch and saying he loved Katie Holmes. But I do think he's kind of a nut job <laughs> in real life. But I love him as an actor. Um. I love Farrah Fawcett. She was not my favorite Charlie's Angel, though. That that goes to Cheryl Ladd. <laughs> but uh, I didn't really that, watch it much. And that's that's another. You know, we were talking about sexism uh, in Hollywood during this time. Um, Charlie's Angels. It was almost as if they just switched. When somebody left the cast, they just oh, let's get another blonde. Let's get another hot blonde. Let's get another hot brunette. That's essentially all it was. And Three's Company, didn't they yep. go through a couple of Chrissy's? Yep. Oh, that was Farrah Fawcett too. No, it wasn't. No, anyway. no, that was uh, Thigh Master. Be Thigh Master. Thigh Master. Chick. I can't ah, think of damn her. It. Someone in someone in the comments. Somebody in the remember. comments. <laughs> you, but this movie, Logan's Run. Um, so when I went back and rewatched it, I went ahead and splurged. I got the extended. I, I rented the extended cut, and it's a, it's maybe twenty more minutes, but it's. It was all this cutting room floor. It was already produced, already good. It's just that they had to cut it out to keep it PG for the mm -hmm. for the big screen. A lot of so, OGs. I mean, there was yes, all that <laughs> extra twenty minutes was all the, the there was some t there was quite a bit of gratuitous nudity, all female by the way, yeah. which I never understood. But that last twenty, the uh, extra twenty minutes was yeah, just all, basically all TNA and just the gratuitous sexual i'm sure movies are still like that they're still teeny you know teen you know teen a movies still being made but i don't know if it's as it's a if it's as I'm ubiquitous see, as I'm before i'm seeing more regular people in movies and shows than i ever have before you'll see you know people like me overweight you know plain james with glasses you'll see average joes you know more of those in movies but still the mm -hmm. but still the spotlights on the the very attractive name and, tracy name a movie where you see full frontal male nudity can you do it a movie yeah i i think john travolta did it in urban cowboy yeah and sylvester I, stallone did it in party at kitty and studs but that's i think that's technically a porno i can't think of, of a movie i can think of a tv show but when i tell you the tv show you're probably going to laugh because they're being sexualized for the same reason that women are and that's queer as folk on showtime naked men all over the place but that is a show geared toward gay men and those men are being sexualized for the same reasons women are being sexualized yeah i i don't know call me weird but if, if it if if the, if the movie calls for it go for it but you know don't be so oh, oh. You know what's what's wrong? Uh, what what's the taboo against male nudity? I don't get that either. I don't either. I think you yeah, know if you're weird. we're in this for equality, equality well, is exactly. equality. Yep. Yeah, but we could get into a whole debate about that. But this was a movie. This movie is so bad, it's good. I mean, as it comes to a movie, movie, it's kind of a cheesy '70s movie, but it has oh, a good I, thing. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, like it. it. It's so bad. It, it, it's good. It, it, I mean, it's, yeah, it it holds up. It, if anyone yeah. wants to go back and rewatch it or watch it for the first time, it totally holds up. You yeah. got to look at it through a '70s lens, though. You're not going to see CGI, but it. I think it really holds up. It, the it, practical you know effects what, it's, are really good. Yep, it's better than 2001. Yeah. 2001, I think, was the same director as Apocalypse Now. You know how some of these movies get really freaking weird at the end, and there's multiple like. Like 12 monkeys, you you don't really know how, there's five different ways it, you could have ended Inception. you and your buddies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Inception. Yeah. Yep. 
this one it ends it ends on a hopeful note exactly and yeah, so 2001 does not no <laughs> yeah planet of the apes certainly did not uh well it kind of i mean there was only one possible outcome yeah unless they were really on another planet <laughs> but then when uh, they saw statue of liberty in the beach yeah. they knew where they were yeah and any debate that you had walking out to the car after seeing that movie would just be someone that didn't get it. Hey, speed of light travel. When you when you go close to the speed of light, you don't age. Every you know, <laughs> you come back and your X number of centuries beyond. You know, everyone you knew is dead. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how. And the whole the whole thing was. I mean, the, well, we could get into a whole discussion about maybe we'll do Planet of the Apes at another time. But this we have this almost 1984 big brother is watching you they control your every move um they kill you at age 30 and make you think you're having some re religious regeneration experience and then they have these police known as sandmen that will literally chase you if you try to run and they call it running and logan is a sandman he's having doubts uh he's in his very fancy apartment he's looking for a sexual partner for the evening so he punches something into his computer the first thing to appear is a very handsome young man so we get the idea that sexuality is fluid you know there's really no difference between gay and straight that's in right because in he journey. makes a little he makes a little face and he goes like nah, not, not tonight for me. and he not switches <laughs> oh not tonight yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then uh jessica appears and he's another sees thing him. another thing um I saw on YouTube, someone was talking, breaking down this movie. Um, it was a while ago I watched it. Um, uh, the main characters, the main actors in this movie were, were, were afterthoughts. They had some bigger names, mm -hmm. but um, Alfred Hitchcock at the time, and the last time I was on your show, we did an Al Alfred Hitchcock movie, so this is a cool segue. Um, he was known for sniping. He, he'd be looking at, hey, who's making movies over there? Oh, I like him, and he would snipe the actors all the time, and so mm -hmm. the ones that they got for this movie got sniped by Alfred Hitchcock for one of his things. Yep, and they ended up with mostly, except for Farrah Fawcett, mostly British stage actors, like Michael York, Shakespearean trained. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jessica Anglin, Shakespearean trained. These are all British stage actors. And the whole... Uh, Except for Farrah control, Yeah, the whole mind control, the 1984 aspect. I see it from a different... And I, at least I'm aware of this. But being active duty military most of my adult life and, and being in the electronic surveillance field, mm -hmm. um, I've never had... A, what I consider what most people have a normal sense of privacy. My, my privacy bubble is very small. I'm not used to, uh, uh, I'm not used to having privacy, whether it be in a barracks room, uh, you know, open shower areas, you know, uh, open squad bays, you know, tents, you know, ba battlefields, you know, every, everywhere I went, there's zero privacy. So I, I guess I, I someone like me, I, I could live in this dome city, way more easily with constant surveillance than uh, probably your average yeah, citizen. I could too. I mean, that's just how I'm geared. You know, I only did two years in the military. I wasn't career that's, like you, but yeah. I, but you got I was, that feeling. Sometimes two years is all it takes to get that kind of mindset. And it's kind of sad. I, I, I really, I was, we give up a lot of our freedoms to make sure everyone else has theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But it makes so I, I look at a movie like this, not as like, ooh, that would be terrible to live in, but I could see how most people would. Well, you also have to look at it from the thing of they're trying to, whatever this dome is, they're trying to preserve society. And even though it's controlled by AI, on only AI as far as we can see, there had to be somebody that developed and programmed and coded that AI. So there was human thought into that somewhere, unless it's some sort of alien, but we don't get that, that feel from this movie. Or Tracy, book. let me ask you, um, do you, do you know about the AGI, the artificial general intelligence, the singularity, you know, that everyone, all the futurists are talking about? Do you think that is a possibility and what, do you think it'll happen in our lifetime? Not in our lifetime, not in your, your and I lifetime. I don't think any Gen Xer will live to see it. Um, there might be some millennials that are elderly that get to see it, uh, but I think it'll be more of a Gen, Gen Z, Generation Alpha type of thing. I think quantum computing and um, and the neural networking, 
I think it's going to happen in totally our lifetime in the next 10, yeah. 20 years. You think so? and, and hang on, folks. I'm the one shouting that no one listens to. And, and really, I'm not an expert in the field, but there are so many experts that are thinking the same thing. It's going to happen. And I think sooner rather than Tracy does, but it is going to happen. And, and something where AGI basically controls our every movement for, for the good of us, as long as it's goals are aligned with ours if if it diverges in any way we're we're gone boy well I, i'm wondering on logan's run is that what happened because there had to be humans that built this this ai did it suddenly become self-aware and eliminate its creators or is it doing what the creators programmed it to do and now the creators have passed on to i think the former but i don't think the whoever made this movie envisioned that but that's how i'm looking at it now because i think based on what agi AI, yeah, because yeah, looked once out and they, saw what humans did to the world, exactly. and they're not going to let that happen again. Once Skynet gets online, <laughs> it, whatever its goals are, we're, we just have to cross our fingers that it aligns with our goals. Right. I, at the very least, it, at least keep a few of us in zoos. Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm all for like uh, nanobot technology, them being able to send a drone to my front door with a hypodermic needle that a robot can inject into me and it goes in and performs microsurgery on me and fixes whatever's wrong with me. I'm all for that. To most people, to a lot of people listening, that sounds so fantastical, but that is our reality. That mm -hmm. is, uh, that is our, that's going to be our reality. Yeah. Yep. You know, I, 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 I see it, you know, like Elon Musk for as much as I don't agree with everything he does. I think it's fantastical he's in space and he's making all these, you know, his talking about maybe one day we could cure nearsightedness with a a shot to the brain, you know, uh, and I'm like, hey, if they can make my eyeballs go back to the size they're supposed to be and I'm not nearsighted anymore with an injection, please do it. <laughs> you know, if there's a nanobot they can put in there that'll fix my eyes, go for it, you know? The, the great um, Van Gogh, um, mm -hmm. Thomas Edison, they were all... Uh, hugely funded if not independently wealthy with huge staffs helping them out mm -hmm. making stuff happen and at the time his contempt their contemporaries were laughing at them and saying you're excess spending you're too rich you're spending wrong what about the, what about using it to help out the rest of society you know it's just like it is today with musk and all the big you know and, and branson but you know i think society needs visionaries like that idealists it their their ideas might not always come to pass but they're extending the boundaries of our of our ideas exactly and who knows i mean when we get to the next movie this is a little more uh conducive with that movie but our planet is dying it's going to be you know i don't unless we speed it up to the point it dies in the next two or three hundred years i mean the sun is eventually going to go a dwarf, full dwarf and, and kill us all. So maybe getting into space to find another planet where possibly our species can survive is part of that next leap, you know? If if we have an ultimate goal of, well, it, we won't be humanity by, by the time it happens. We still have a good solid billion years left on this planet. That's plenty yeah. of time to become a, a civilization, one, a type one civilization yeah, and colonize. <clears throat> but I, you know what? With, with uh, oh, we're getting off on tangents here. Real, no, real, this is, I, I, I don't think, think it'll be humans or, this. huh? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't I'm think it'll be. <laughs> okay, I don't think it'll be humans. Whatever uh, humans evolve into, because that's so much time, we won't be Homo sapiens anymore. But I don't think it'll even be our descendants that are actually doing the colonization. I think it'll be AGI, because yeah. they'll they'll be able to reproduce themselves much easier on the go, and 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 much faster. Um, I, I think, you know what, I'm happy if our species gets stuck here and then slowly moves away as the sun expands, you know, in a billion years. And like you said, yeah, if we might not have a solid billion years because the expansion of the sun is is the least of our worries right now. It's mm -hmm. it's 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. Yep. And, yep. and you, I... I you know, I didn't know, since you're a little more right-leaning than me, you're a little right of center, I'm a little left of center. I thought, it, it, it kind of surprises me that you're on board with the climate change thing. A lot of people from your socio-political viewpoint w do doubt it. It's the vocal minority that doubt it. It's uh, the radicals that doubt it. I, I know a lot of 
actual, I don't identify as a conservative. I'm a little more right than you are, but I, mm -hmm. uh, I do know people that actually uh, identify as conservatives that are very much mm -hmm. environmentalists. They're more about conservation than anything else. And so a lot of them are hunters and fisher, fishermen. They understand that those things serve a vital function that we should be, you know, preserving what we have. Um, they all agree that we need to get off fossil fuels, but they don't believe it's something like a Greta Thunberg where you got to do it in 12 years because the number of people that would starve or go without power during that transition time, it's something we got to do bit by bit. It's not going to be an easy transition, but they agree it should yeah. happen. Have you seen that new electric Ford F-150 pickup? I yeah. think that's going to be a game changer because that's the best selling vehicle for like, it's hands down the best selling vehicle in, in, in the world. And the fact that they get an electro version with that much torque and power, and if they can somehow flip that vocal minority, the the anti climate changers. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you still hear me? It just said yeah. like internet connection is unstable. No, if I they can somehow flip the mindset of that vocal minority into thinking instead of rolling coal and putting those big exhausts out of the back of your pickup and choking out the guys behind you. It, flip it and think, oh, you know what the manly thing is, is look at all this power and torque in this fully electric F-150. You know, if you can get them thinking like that, well, that's that's the vehicle I want to be putting fuck Biden stickers on, then it, that would really help. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you know, the problem we have to solve, and it's the it's the problem that no one's talking about, is, okay, let we go to all electric vehicles. We've got to improve our grid to be able to support that many. So we're right back to the whole problem of how do we produce electricity? You know, can Great solar point. keep up with that? We're going to need some fossil fuels to help keep up with that demand. Or we do, I don't know if solar can advance that far, or we actually do the unspeakable that no one's talking about, and that's nuclear. That is the best, most renewable source of energy yeah. there is. Just getting rid of the waste is a huge problem. But yeah, yeah I mean... It's not, I mean, it, we need to entertain the idea. And, and nuclear facilities now are much safer than they were when they started. It's not Chernobyl anymore. W it's will not. we have another Chernobyl? Probably. But, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a risk cost benefit analysis. And, you know, yeah. I think it needs to be on the table at least. Um, my electric vehicle, I've thought about this. And someone, inevitably, someone will point out, well, you're still burning fossil fuels for that thing because every, th every time you go charge it, where do you think you're getting that electricity? Mm -hmm. It might not always be from renewable wind, solar, hydroelectric, right? Mm -hmm. um, it might be from uh, uh, um, natural gas at, at, yeah. the very, at the very cleanest, but usually it's going to be from coal and oil, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but here's how I look at it. Okay, we definitely need to fix that and get the grid like just like you said the grid on fully renewable but in the meantime if you if you run a gas burner a regular vehicle you're burning twice because you're you're pulling the gas you're putting the gas in your vehicle that gas used fossil fuel to even make and refine so there you burned and now you're burning it again in your own vehicle so you're burning twice i'm at the very worst i'm only burning once the electricity I get may or may not be something was burned to get that electricity. But and the other thing is, you usually charge at night, which I I have solar panels on my roof, so I'm not using the I'm not using my own solar panels because I don't have battery backup yet. If I had a battery backup in the garage, I'd be using my own power that I generated that that morning that the day before to to power my own car. Then I'm good. Right. But the problem yep. with that is if you do do your own battery, then you're taking the public utility out of it, and they don't like that. So that's another thing we've got to worry about. That's where yeah, the libertarian Tex comes out. <laughs> exactly. Texas law is um, you have to stay on the grid no matter what. Yeah. No one can be – if you live in a residential, zoned residential um, neighborhood, you can't, you can't click the grid. You're not allowed yeah. to. It's, it's crazy. Then, Even if you're totally self-sufficient, if you're connected to the grid in any way, um, when all the power goes down, you go down. Even if you could generate your own power, you're not allowed to. Because let's say in a hurricane or a, wind, a thunderstorm, and if they're, they don't want to risk, if they've got workers out there working on the wires and you're selling back surplus power back to the grid, which I do every day when it's sunny, that could, that could injure them. 
Yep. When they turn the grid down, they want it completely down. Yep. So bottom line, sometimes I feel like government wants us living in a dome where they kill us at age 30 <laughs> and then eat us. <laughs> but who, who are the biggest um, consumers? Who spend the most money? Who go, who um, helps the GDP more? A 50-year-old or a 20-year-old? Why would you want to kill? Uh, maybe if you want to thin the herd, kill the under 20-year-olds, a few of them, and let the rest grow up to be 50-year-olds. You know, that would be better for the GDP. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we could debate what's proper eugenics all day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Ouch. That's true. And hey, uh, but as know, far as overpopulation goes, um, based on my limited knowledge, I think the earth could hold 14 billion. We're at almost eight now. Yeah. Um, starvation right now, a third of the planet is over, overeating, and two thirds of the planet is either starving or approaching starving. So it's a matter of redistributing all that. Yep. And yeah. I think the earth could hold 14 billion comfortably based on what I know. Yeah. So and I don't think overpopulation have, is a problem. Think of it in the 70s when this book was written and this movie was made. Very limited agricultural technology. Now look at us. I mean, for as much as people want to hate on GMOs, GMOs is the only thing that's going to keep this planet from starving. You know, it may not be perfect, but you can eat it and it's going to sustain life. You know, may, maybe it gives you cancer at age 80. Okay. <laughs> That's horrible. You know, and I don't it's want true. that, but it's better than starving to death at age 30. Yeah. GMO is only a, a, say my daughter, if she's listening right now, she's a, she just got her first job. She just graduated college as a, um, in her bachelor's in horticulture. She mm -hmm. just got a job at the local arboretum here. So she's super excited. But every time I bring up, you know, crops, hybridization and GMOs, she, I always get a, I always get a tutorial on why I'm wrong about everything. But as far as I know, GMOs are all about the pesticides that are being used on the plants. Mm -hmm. um, we, we all know mm -hmm. pictures of corn when corn before this hybridization. It was, yeah, it was about this big and it was barely edible. And now we get these big, and look at the cows. Well, that, that's not even flora. I'll stick with flora, not fauna. But you know, uh, our, look, our, our fruits and vegetables are gigantic. And that that's, fertilizer technology which is it, it, it's as far as i know it's breeding of species and hybridization yeah. right and that's not gmo when we say gmo it's um uh changing the dna in plants to be able to be resistant to a certain type of pesticide that's usually proprietary to whoever's doing the dna like monsanto monsanto Correct. controls uh what's their pesticide gosh damn uh, roundup yeah. So Monsanto makes Roundup. Monsanto is also the company that um, Owns manipulates, the the, engineers the DNA, the DNA yeah. for the corn or the soybeans to make it resistant to Roundup. Right. I don't know how that can cause cancer. If it's resistant, it is spraying. Now, my, my daughter would tell me any man-made pesticide is bad for the environment because you're spraying it everywhere and then all these wildlife comes in deer birds and then they carry it off and it leaks into our waterways and she's all about natural and organic but that's just it doesn't produce the kind of yields that we need you can't and it also takes up vast amounts of land you can with the larger hybridized you can grow a lot more in a smaller track of land and leave the land to the animals you know so be a good point. We could, we could, but like I said, um, technology is wonderful. So you look at something like Logan's Run, where technology, they, they, they envision technology as a way of taking, of taking over the world and keeping us in a vast state of population control. And then you have Logan getting interested in this cult. And then he and J Jessica make a run to try to get out. So Logan's Run. He ends up in the underneath where they discover this android down there that is guarding all these frozen bodies that are being processed into food to feed the people up top. And then they eventually get out and get to what is the ruins of Washington, D.C., and they find Peter Ustinov as this old, supposed to be 70 or 80-year-old man living with a bunch of cats in the Senate chamber, which is a never a better 
allegory for the yes. Senate, for Congress. <laughs> Hurting a bunch of cats. Um, oh, and, and completely unused and unproductive also. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's got double, their own double needs, meanings. Fulfilling yeah. their own needs. Yep. And they've never seen animals before because there's no animals where they are. So they're amazed and they're amazed that a human can get that old. And so they take him back and basically they are able to destroy the main AI, the, the power core. And now you have all, like you said, in the one, the scene that your parents were in, they're all standing out in front of the waterfall. That's when they go Peter back Houston. in and tell right. everybody the truth and they lead everybody out. Yeah. yeah. My parents were in the group that got led out into the Fort Worth water gardens. And my, my dad said, uh, uh, so we, we go frame by frame and we point out where's mom, where's dad. And he tells me the story is like when they were waiting for their, for, for the scenes to start, um, all those cast extras were getting baked. Everyone was high off their ass <laughs> during the filming seventies, <laughs> man. Yeah. And then there they are po pointing at touching and pointing at Peter Houston off like they've never, because they've never seen an elderly person before. And then that's where the movie ends just suddenly. So it's a very hopeful note that hopefully humanity will return to its former self. Hope. Hope. Yeah. However, then 1973's Soil and Green, based on a another novel called Make Room, Make Room, which uh, was much darker than the movie, if you can believe it, uh, enters in, and it's actually set, whereas... Um, Logan's Run was set in like 2177. Uh, Soylent Green was actually set in 2022. So. Oh, snap. <laughs> that puts a whole new paint job on things, doesn't it? Yeah. So what is Beyond Burger and Impossible Whoppers? That's <laughs> <laughs> but um, so basically this... Whereas in Logan's Run, we're dealing with an unknown catastrophe, I would say by the looks of the outside, probably nuclear apocalypse or, or some other major military man-made disaster. Uh, whereas here, it's more about population control. Uh, overpopulation uh, is the main thing. And you've got 40 billion people living in New York City alone. Uh, and it's become as bad as any city in any developing country in the world, any starving developing country in the world, and food is very hard to get. Uh, natural food, you know, like something like a jar of jelly can go for $150. I mean, that's how expensive. Most people exist off of crumbs of the soylent product, and they're soylent red, soylent yellow, soylent green, all uh, most of it is made from plant plankton, supposedly, and that's how people exist. And the poor actually buy the crumbs left over from when the rich eat the full-on soil. It's like crackers, you know, and that's how they survive. And so electricity is in short supply. Uh, people, live, two families live in an apartment, you know, that kind of overpopulation. And in this one, we were talking about how women's rights seem to be diminished. The same thing here. Women are not even considered human. They're the same as furniture. I mean, no, they're, actual, called, they're actually literally called, called furniture. Furniture. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, they're actually treated as possessions. Uh, they can't it's, work. It's, they have no rights. Uh, yeah. and it's like... Whenever there's a human catastrophe, human rights always go out the door, it seems. Uh, and then you've got Charlton Heston living in an apartment with Saul, played by um, uh, Edward G. Robinson, uh, who in his final film role, actually, uh, he died of bladder cancer within months of the wrap of that film. Uh, oh, man, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, who is a former college professor who is old enough to remember the world before it all went to crap. And he has this tiny little garden that he grows inside where he's able to get some fresh vegetables and, and stuff like that. 
And he also uh, hooked up this bicycle to an old car battery that can generate electricity for their apartment. So every day before Charlton Heston, who's a police detective, goes off to work, he pedals for a couple of hours and charges up the battery so Saul will have power while he's gone. And he's investigating the murder of a Soylent Green or Soylent executive who was mysteriously killed. And uh, it just shows, I think, humanity at its at its worst, this whole movie. This and Logan's Run, they missed the mark on the overpopulation thing. I, I don't think that's such a big a problem as they foresaw. Everything else, not everything, but so many other things in these two movies, they hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as far as... Uh, You've got one corporation basically controlling uh, the world. So like uh, the top one percent, basically yeah. with all the money, and everyone else scrambling for crumbs. That yeah, and, literally uh, yeah. crumbs. And human rights going out the window, like uh, this culture war we got going on right now, where you know, uh, and I don't know if you can attribute that one hundred percent to our um, income inequality, uh, the the disparity in income. You know, the the top one percent has got most of the money, and the top ten percent have basically all the money, and then all the rest of us have to work three jobs. So the more, I've always said that it, it, every civilization in history that gets to a tipping point on income inequality ends only one, it, they all end the same way with, with rich people's heads in baskets. You know, it happened in France, it happened in Greece, happened in Rome, in Italy, it, every, throughout the world happened in China. Anytime the rich elite get too rich and elite, and they they can't keep the reins on the 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 huddled masses anymore. It, guillotines drop. It happens every yeah. time, or someone gets put up against the wall. It, it it works itself out one way or the other, and it's usually very bloody. Yeah, and I hope it doesn't come to. I would don't want it to come to that. But a lot of the politicians that we see out there, grandstanding for us normal people, they're going to be in the <laughs> they're going to be put up against the wall the same as the other elites because they're elites masquerading as if they care. In a lot of ways. And uh, what you said, the Soylent Green was the new product. I think it was Soylent Red and Yellow. Those mm -hmm. others were made from plant-based algae. But the algae, the seas are getting affected now. And the, there's no fish. There's no sea life anymore. And all there's left, uh, even the algae is getting really thin. So Soylent Green was based on the plankton. They were starting to use the plankton that the whales feed on, which are animals. But there's... Well, spoiler alert from 40 years ago, but um, there's not even any plankton left. That's why they're, the soil and green is humans. Right. Just like and in the Matrix. The yep. Matrix was doing the same thing. They used, they used that idea because as you grow old, you're too old to be in the pods anymore. You get liquefied and fed to the babies in the pods yep. to keep the Matrix going. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, basically, uh, thanks to Saul and him, being able as a former professor to reach out to people that he knew and get a copy of literally internal soylent documents. They realized that they are making soylent from humans, namely prisoners and the elderly uh, and those that choose euthanasia. Because believe it or not, in this movie, the government will, if you decide you don't want to live in this miserable world anymore, they will humanely put you down. Just like Logan's Run. Just like But Logan's you get to decide. It, it's yeah. a conscious, yeah, it's voluntary here. Yeah. And they will use That's your right, body the old to man. Who, who was it that went? They, Edward and G. Robinson. They, they, so, yes, they show him the scenes of the wild life, stuff he's probably never he, seen he before. Hasn't seen a world. Since he's a teenager. Yeah. Right. Now, who was the one that lived in, is that the one that lived in the library? See, women, women are called furniture, but if you're old enough to remember the before four times, um, you're called a book. Yeah. That's it's, what Saul was. He was a book. Yeah, he was a book. Yeah. yeah, he had all the information. Anyone that still had books in libraries, they're mm -hmm. the, they're in they're actually called books. The people are the people with all the knowledge. Okay. So it's kind of like idiocracy. Everyone's dumbed down. Mm -hmm. People don't remember. Very few people remember. Um, that still have some of this knowledge. It wasn't passed on. Right. And Saul decides that he is sick of living in this world. He's, his wife is gone. His kids are gone. So he chooses euthanasia. Charlton Heston's character, whose name is Thorne, um, kind of joint, you know, accompanies him to the government facility 
where they show him scenes of his youth, of what the world used to be like, and very peaceably inject him with medicines that stop his heart. Uh, light, class. <laughs> I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Sign here, please, Mr. Roth. A full 20 minutes. Oh, certainly. Guaranteed. and put him to sleep. And that was the last scene that Edward Gene Robinson ever filmed. And his wife, who had been on the set the entire time, refused to be there that day because she said she knew he would be dying soon because he was terminal. And she just couldn't watch it. Can you imagine how meta That's that was for him? Heavy. I did yeah. not know any of that. That's crazy. Charlton Heston said he didn't realize that he was sick with cancer. And so after he heard that he passed, he said he suddenly remember he said it was one of the most emotional scenes he ever filmed and you know whether or not you like Charlton I love Charlton Heston always have I think he's a great guy I, th I think he's I, I'm all about his second amendment and also he's a great <laughs> conservationist and a hunter I mean he's a great con concert he believes in preserving the environment you won't hear that you know in media but he does and he said that he really believed in this project and he actually put some of his own money because at the time they really thought population was going to be the the thing that brought down civilization over population that hit him pretty hard then huh when he yeah. found out later oh god that's crazy and you know my fellow vegetarians when i tell them that i'm pro hunting they're like and and, and pro firearms they're like all right <laughs> that that blows them away but you know um the the war well i i don't want i'm a vegetarian primarily because i'm against animal suffering i don't want any yeah. living thing to uh, feel pain mm -hmm. it's an empathetic thing um it, even if there were even if they didn't use pneumatic jackhammers and slitting throats and throwing the baby the male chicks into a chipper shutter because they're not even needed for egg laying um, all the horrendous things that go on in an abattoir, if that were removed, if there was 100%, no pain, if still killing non-human animals for our food just seems very human centric. Well, I'm going to throw you a curveball. You know, yeah. Everybody gets offended by the idea of cannibalism. Oh, just real quick though, as far as hunting goes, if you're, if you're shooting it for personal use and you're using all of that animal, I, you, and you're not using factory farming methods and that thing, it lived the, its best life out, out in the woods somewhere. I, I think that's exponentially better than eating prepackaged meats in the supermarket. Okay, go ahead. Yep, absolutely. And also hunters, whether or not they want to, they do perform a environmental duty of reducing population so that plants survive and there's enough food to feed the other wild animals out there. So reducing population. There is so, something to be said for that, yeah. So, but anyway, so mm -hmm. everybody, you know, get, we all realize that now they're using the bodies of the recently euthanized, executed prisoners, really anybody else that dies, to make Soylent Green and probably other Soylent products. And it ended up that the executive that he's been investigating his murder was actually killed by the corporation because he was beginning to have moral conflict about what they were doing and they were he was going to be a whistleblower he was yeah. keeping he was keeping journals and he was about to make them go public exactly and at this point uh the detective doesn't want to believe that mm -hmm. people may uh, the prisoners may or may not be used for this and it, he's he's very skeptical he's he's tracking it down with a skeptical mindset not yep. until the very end when he realizes it's, it's anyone the bodies that dies. in the conveyor yes belt. in the conveyor belt
Yeah. And when he shouts to everyone, the famous line, Soil and Green is people. people. And and, and no you see the reactions. The last scene of the movie, right before it fades to black, and it, it didn't even get there. No one cared. No one listened to this nut. Yeah. And, or even if they believed him, like, would people even care? I don't know. Well, that, that goes down to whatever. We're tribal, you know, our species, and we honestly believe it's wrong to eat our own kind. But if you and I as atheists, we believe that we're just more evolved primates, what makes us different than any other animal species on the face of the earth when it comes Tracy, to Tracy, if you and I were the sole survivors in a plane wreck and we were stranded in the Andes and, and you there died. There dead bodies broke, and we could survive, yeah. Well, like, yeah. Well, if, if it was just you and me stranded on a desert island and you died first, I would eat your face. I wouldn't care. I'd probably start with like your thighs, but yeah. Well, you could live it, a year off be... my thigh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> if I died first, man, I'd be a smorgasbord. You'd survive plenty long enough to get saved. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I and if you think about Soylent Green. This company is bad as there's, they're an evil corporation and they're keeping it from the people. But they are really the last source of food left in the world. So how moral or amoral are they? People have chosen well, to euthanize themselves, and prisoners yeah. are being executed for crimes they committed. Is it really immoral for them to make them into food to keep the world alive? Look at this. They already – all right, so there's in, uh, income inequality. Throughout the movie, income inequality riots that pop up all the time, and right. they have very, very surgical, precise methods of dealing with this. you got to go and watch the movie how they yeah. do it. They, they've got these machines that can just pick up the entire riot and put them in the – like a dump truck, like a garbage truck, and put them in and the back of the truck. probably take them to be made into soil, probably. Most likely, most likely. Yeah. But, all right, so riots are already being, even though they're very common, they're being controlled well. If the government just said, uh, just came public with it, hey, soil and green is people, you can keep eating soil and yellow and red until it runs out, but soil and green is people that were euthanized or, you know, we're not killing them just for this. You know, here's the people we're killing for it you're still you're still safe there would probably be a big uprising but if between if given the uh choice between starving to death and eating swirling green people would still yeah I, yeah I think the the biggest moral failure is keeping it from the public yeah yeah and everyone yeah. <laughs> that soil at green and logan's run <laughs> wow that was a tight hour wasn't it that's was good yeah and it ended on a, and unlike Logan's run, which ended with hope, Soylent Green ends with absolutely no hope whatsoever. We're left with the idea that yeah. the algae and the plankton will eventually run out, so Soylent Yellow and Red will be a thing of the past, or they'll just start making that out of people, too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, humanity, nothing says that, you know, that's, as atheists, uh, we don't believe in destiny or fate, Be and we're not the pinnacle of of evolution. We're we're in the middle of a, a process that's going to continue. Yeah. There's nothing special about us in this time in this particular meat sack that we live in. Yeah. So nothing says that uh, nothing's guaranteed. It, yeah. it, something could happen tomorrow, and and just be, that could be it. Well, we got to keep hope, but yeah. Yeah, but if you know if, if like I said, if we were in a plane crash and I died. I would want you to live because in that way I live on in a way if you want to, you know, if the survivors want to do what they did yeah. in the Andes, which I'm actually covering the Andes crash this week, that, that famous story of the rugby team. Yeah. If you yeah. if, if you can find sustenance from my body, I always have a great respect for the Jewish religion because I've spoken to a rabbi before and he told me that's their version of an afterlife is that you live on and the good deeds that you did. And the, in your family, that's your way of living on. So I think if, you know, if my existence can benefit someone else, I live on that way. So that's as spiritual as I get. <laughs> uh, it's just a, a kind of a tangent. Um, I'm not going to get, my mom got cremated and I'm thinking, how would I want, there's a company that does tree pods where they'll just take your body after you've given your organs to science, whatever's left over, it goes in a tree pod and gets planted under uh, an oak sapling, a mighty oak sapling, right? And then you're the fertilizer for this oak. I think that's really cool. And, and, and uh, my mom getting cremated 
is is kind of the exact opposite. It burned and choked up into the atmosphere and further contributing to the CO2 problem or whatever. But either way, your atoms are going to go somewhere. But yeah. I think the tree pot is a better option. Yeah. <laughs> and there we have it, everyone. <laughs> I hope you Thanks enjoyed for having this. Me. Yeah, well, and please go subscribe to Jim's channel. I will link it right up here. He's great if you like uh, good, uh, good atheist and uh, skeptic content. Uh, he also discusses discusses a lot of geopolitical, sociopolitical topics over there. Great, great channel. I highly recommend it. Thank and you. With, and with that being said, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Keto and Crime, out. How long does it take you?